Hey everyone, Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture on the French Revolution. Um, we are on chapters 10 and 11. Let's get started. So, in the prior uh, lecture, ladies and gentlemen, we focused on the context, uh, kind of some background uh, information to the French Revolution, and the major causes to the French Revolution. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on uh, the early revolution, the early parts of the revolution, and the revolution starting. Now, uh, in terms of understanding the French Revolution, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's really important to break the uh, French Revolution up into uh, kind of phases. Uh, chronology is really important in understanding the French Revolution, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so the way that I teach the French Revolution and the way that I understand the French Revolution is through six different phases, okay? Uh, there's a lot of moving parts to, uh, to the revolution, a lot of stuff going on. And so just understanding the chronology and the different phases of it really helps you kind of understand uh, well, what's going on in the French Revolution. So today we're going to be focusing on the early uh, early parts of the revolution, the revolution starting, and the very first phase, which I uh, kind of label the phase of the National Assembly, okay? Now, I want to give you the six phases because uh, you're going to be seeing, um, or we're going to be going through the six phases throughout the entirety of this uh, of this lecture. So the first phase, which we're going to be uh, talking about today, ladies and gentlemen, is um, the National Assembly. The second phase is the Legislative Assembly, ladies and gentlemen. The third phase is uh, the Convention, which is the First French uh, Republic. Uh, after the Convention, we have the next phase, which is uh, the Directory. After the Directory, uh, we have the uh, the, uh, the Consulate, and then we end um, the French. The end of the French Revolution. The very last phase is Napoleon's Empire. So let me repeat that again. Our very first phase is the National Assembly. Our second phase is the Legislative Assembly. Our third phase is the Convention, which is the First French Republic. Um, after the convention, we have the fourth phase, which is the directory, our fifth phase, which is the consulate, and our uh, last and sixth phase, which is Napoleon's empire. Okay, today we're going to be focusing on kind of the first phase uh, and, and uh, the events that kind of go on with that. Okay, um, so uh, when we last left off, ladies and gentlemen, the causes. France is in debt. It, it, uh, they are having financial troubles, a lot of uh, financial instability in France, and so uh, Louis the Sixteenth, ladies and gentlemen, is forced to convene the Estates General, and this is in 1789. There was a lot of excitement uh, uh, in France over this, ladies and gentlemen, and you had representatives from all three estates um, uh, convene at this Estates General uh, to talk about their problems. Okay, now all the representatives from the uh, the three estates, ladies and gentlemen, were men. Women were not uh, represented and not allowed to be represented, and typically wealthy, even in the third estate. So you had the very wealthy, wealthy of the third estate representing, being the representatives of the third estate. Now, this is a big problem, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, in leading up to the fighting, we haven't gotten to the fighting yet. The revolution really hasn't started yet, but this is going to be a major disagreement and a major problem for the revolution. Um, or excuse me, for the Estates General, is that before the, the Estates General even gathered, there was a huge disagreement over the organization and the voting, okay, the voting. Uh, and the aristocracy uh, and the clergy, the first two estates, ladies and gentlemen, are going to make multiple attempts to limit the influence of the third estate, and they want to do this through voting, okay? Now, what the, and I'm going to kind of go through the, the, the problem with voting in more detail. Um, but you had um, uh, this assembly of notables, and it's going to demand that each estate has an equal number of representatives. Um, and then also, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in uh, September of uh, 1788, the Parliament of Paris ruled that uh, uh, voting in the Estates General should be conducted by order, and that each estate should have one vote. Now, the problem with this, ladies and gentlemen, and we're going to look at uh, a couple graphics, is this, this disagreement over voting between the three estates already is making things bad, okay? And it's mainly because the first two estates are trying to come up with a way to take power away from the third estate. So uh, whenever there's a vote or anything, the third estate is not going to be able to kind of get their way, all right? And you see the first two estates, uh, the clergy and the nobility, trying to create a system of where they get what they want, okay? And, and we're going to be able to see that in the voting. So w this is how... Uh, the uh, the uh, the nobility and the clergy want to vote is they want to simply give um, each estate one vote within the estates general. Now we can kind of see how this really uh, uh, you know benefits the first two estates, but not the third estate because simply if each estate gets one vote, well then the first two estates can simply team up, combine their votes, and overrule the third estate. And so the third estate 
the Thursday is not having this, and they are not stoked on this at all. And, and so this is a this already, ladies and gentlemen, is fraying the relationships between the three estates. There and uh, by the time the estates general convenes, they will not solve this problem. Okay, they are not going to solve this voting problem. All right. So you know, um, uh, uh, this is this the, the the problem of voting is a big problem. All right. So. Um, you know, the public's going to be upset with this, the efforts to dominate voting the first two estates. Mainly the nobility is really involved in this, but the clergy is as well, too. Uh, the public's going to be really uh, upset about this. The monarchy is going to respond by trying to strengthen the third estate, um, uh, allow the third estate to have uh, twice, as many as rep uh, twice as many representatives as either the nobles um, or the clergy. And so what the third estate is, is going to want is to vote by representative because they have the most representatives. All right. Um, and we'll and we'll take a look at that. So if voting by representatives, you know, goes down, then the third estate wants that, and the first two estates, the clergy and nobility, do not want that because well, they they don't have as many representatives as the third estate. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, so uh, you know, the, the the clergy has 300 representatives, the aristocracy has 300 representatives, and the third estate has 648 representatives. Well, if they vote by the number of representatives, then the third estate will have a lot of uh, say and power and be able to overrule, the, overrule these two. The idea here that I want you all to understand, ladies and gentlemen, and you don't need to write a, a lot of notes on this, is they are having a huge disagreement, ladies and gentlemen, on how to vote. And this is fraying the relationships before they even get started. Tensions are high. There's not a lot of trust. This is a huge problem. Okay? And this in uh, Abby Seas, he was a, a really important uh, figure um, within this, within the third estate, is... He, he kind of summarized what the third estate wants, okay, he, it, it, with this very famous saying. He said, what is the third estate? It is everything. What has it been heretofore in the political order? Nothing. What does it demand? To become something. He, Abby C.S., is arguing, and we're going to see him again later on uh, when we talk about Napoleon, so don't forget him, but Abby C.S. is saying the third, the third estate has never been recognized. It doesn't have a lot of privilege. It doesn't have a lot of power. What does it want? It wants to be, you know, it wants to become something. It wants to have some say within the government. And that's what the third estate wants, is the third estate sees the first two estates really trying to disenfranchise them, really trying to take away, it, you know, kind of just, uh, uh, you know, make sure that they don't get any political power. And the third estate is not stoked on this and not happy. And this is not good. Okay, uh, the key here is de de de, uh, de, de Leonces, Okay, um, is this was a, uh, the grievances, and each estate was instructed, ladies and gentlemen, to compile a list of suggestions and grievances, and with this uh, uh, here's de de Leonces, the three estates actually had you know a lot of consensus and agreement. Okay, on their grievances against the monarchy and uh, 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 against Louis. Um, but the problem was, is they had, is they, they the, the problem of voting is they're, they're not even going to be able to get this thing started with the Estates General because of their disagreement over voting. And that's really, the Estates General, I mean, the Estates General is really, is where the revolution is going to start. Okay. But the, the three estates, and this is just kind of a, 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 an important point to know, the three estates actually had a lot of consensus and agreement, but it, it's overshadowed by their disagreement over voting. Okay, so the Estates General is going to be convened in May of 1789. Okay, um, and so we are going to see France, um, you know, uh, uh, attempt to, you know, solve this problem of the debt and solve their, their their problems amongst each other. And this is where things start to go down, and we see this awakening of the Third Estate. All right, and I, you don't need to know. You know, every single day, I just kind of want you all to understand the the big picture here. Okay, so. The Estates General, ladies and gentlemen, is convening, they're talking, and they can't even, they can't even, you know, get to the debt because they don't even, the three estates and the representatives don't, can't agree on the voting procedure, okay? And the Estates General, especially the third estate, is going to be over this, okay? They are going to be so over this. Now, the third estate, and this is kind of in the summer of 1789, in June, the third estate is going to invent or excuse me, invite the first and second uh, estates to join them in forming a new government. And a few uh, members are going to join, but not that many. Now, eventually the third estate is going to be like, you know what, we are over this, okay? And they are going to declare themselves the new government of France, okay? The new government of France, and they are going to declare themselves uh, the National Assembly of France. And so we are starting the very first phase of the revolution. The third estate is tired of this, they are that they have uh, 
uh, people, uh, they, there's going to be no consensus on this voting. They're over it. People are, you know, they're, they're, the peasants are suffering, rural, uh, the rural peasantry suffering. Um, this meeting is going nowhere. The third estate is over this, okay? Uh, and eventually, we're going to see the second estate vote to join the assembly. And we're going to see a kind of a weird relationship between the three estates uh, during the summer of 1789. Um, but we're going to see Louis, ladies and gentlemen, make his first major mistake. Okay, similar to Charles I when he kind of goes in to arrest the members of parliament. Louis, okay, is going to uh, prevent the third estate, this new national assembly, from meeting. He's going to kind of lock them out of the estates general. And this is really going to irritate the, the, the third estate. They're like, really, Louis? Really? We, we can't even meet? And so they're going to take the very famous tennis court oath, ladies and gentlemen, of where the, uh, the, the third estate, the representatives of the third estate are going to vow to make a constitution, all right? They're going to take this oath to make a constitution for France, okay? And this is, ladies and gentlemen, this tennis court oath is important because this illustrates Louis not being, not understanding the situation. He is, he is, he is, uh, uh, by making enemies of the third estate, not uh, by attempting, you know, by not attempting to really uh, negotiate with them and, you know, by, by, you know, kind of being adversarial with them, he is going to make the situation a lot worse. And we're going to see him. He's going to make silly mistakes, much like Charles, very, a comparison right there, and make, this situ and, and make this situation worse. Okay? So, you know, uh, Louis XVI, this tennis court oath, really important. He's going to lock the National, Assemb uh, National Assembly out of their meeting place. Okay? Uh, the National Assembly goes to a nearby tennis court where they take an oath to remain together until they have a new constitution for France, which they will write. Okay, and we are going to start to see more nobles and clergy start to join this. Okay, why? Well, they realize, okay, that these, uh, the third estate represents a large majority of the population. And, if, and, we, and they understand that if things start to get out of hand, they represent the majority of the population. And, if, and they are saying this National Assembly that we represent France. And they, they represent the majority of the people. And so... Um, they, the nobles and the, the clergy are, are starting to understand that this situation might get gnarly and out of the hand, and it's going to. It, it's it, it's gonna it's gonna get chaotic. Okay, um, so some nobles, all right, and some clergy are gonna start to join this national assembly, mainly mainly to save themselves. Okay, uh, and we see Louis Louis is gonna lose. He's losing control of the situation. He's gonna really lose control of the situation. Okay, now the national assembly is gonna officially name itself the National Constituent Assembly uh, due to the intention of writing a new constitution. But for the purposes of this class and for the AP exam, ladies and gentlemen, you just need to know this is the National Assembly. Okay, but if you see National Constituent Assembly, it means the National Assembly. It's the same thing. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, this is important. All right, the storming of the Bastille, July fourteenth. 1789. Very important, ladies and gentlemen. And some historians believe that this is the start of the French Revolution because this is where the fighting starts. Okay, this is where the fighting starts. Now, Louis is going to make another mistake again. Okay, and he's going to muster troops. All right, and start to really um, uh, contemplate and, and show that he is ready to use force against the assembly. Okay, not good. Okay, not good. He is just really uh, kind of pouring gasoline on this fire. All right, he, this is this is not a good situation. And 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 I keep comparing this to Charles the First, but look, this is very similar to Charles the First. You know, him going out there and raising his own army, and then Parliament going to raise their own army instead of really trying to reconcile and and calm the tensions and calm the situation down. We see Louis act aggressive. Okay, assertive, and this is this is, uh, and by using force, you're gonna see, you know, for, uh, a reaction from the National Assembly. Okay, the Parisian citizens, okay, and they're be, they're gonna be a really important factor within the revolution. Are gonna rally to protect the Assembly, and so they are going to on July 14th to storm the Bastille for weapons. Okay, the Bastille is a very is very symbolic, uh, symbolic. Excuse me of the um. Of the monarchy, it was it was this gigantic prison in Paris. Um, uh, it was you know mainly for political prisoners, but it really symbolized kind of like the power of the monarchy. And um, uh, there weren't really uh, many prisoners in it when the uh, Parisian citizens storm it. But um, they are going to storm the, uh, the Bastille for weapons. We're going to see uh, um, uh, French soldiers uh, shoot the citizens, and the fighting starts. Okay, and this situation has just gotten way worse. Okay, way worse. Um, the militia of Paris, 
uh, called the National Guard is going to adopt the, the tricolor, which you see kind of in the background right here. This is the flag of uh, France. This is their national flag, um, which they have today. And this is going to be the symbol of the revolution called the tricolor. Okay, this symbol. Okay, uh, and this is and this is the uh, the, uh, the the official uh, uh, symbol and flag of uh, of France today. Okay, the white uh, the white of the uh, the Bourbons, the red and blue of Paris. Okay, so they're going to adopt this symbol. But the situation has gotten really worse now, ladies and gentlemen. Fighting has started. Violence has started, and that's when some historians believe that the French Revolution has started when the violence starts. Okay, all right. So. Now we, the revolution so far, ladies and gentlemen, has started in Paris. It's in an urban area. It's going to spread now to the countryside and we are going to start to see the peasants revolt and the peasants get in on the action. And this is where the nobles and the clergy and Louis, you know, are going to get really nervous, especially the nobles. Okay. It's going to spread to the countryside and the, 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 the revolution is starting to, is starting to get, become, you know, gnarly. All right. So this is occurring almost simultaneously with the urban revolts. The urban revolts are definitely influencing these rural revolts, okay? Uh, and we're seeing the rebellion spread. All right, we're going to see peasants start to burn legal documents, uh, refuse to pay legal dues. Um, they're going to, the you know, remember, peasants during this time are starving. It's an ecological disaster. Peasants are starving. They're overtaxed. Well, they're simply just going to refuse to pay their taxes now. They're simply going to uh, go to uh, a noble's house and take their food, Okay. Um, and they're going to start killing nobles. Okay, we don't we don't have to we don't have to listen to you. Okay, this situation is quickly becoming violent and out of control. Okay, um, but the, the the rebellion is going to spread, and we can see it right here. Okay, so we're, it really starts and facilitated in the uh, urban areas, and then spreads to the countryside where the majority of people are, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, very important for us, ladies and gentlemen. So we're still in the summer of 1789 all the way up from may until august in, Ju in uh, uh, june and july a lot has happened okay very important uh, uh uh night session of august of 1789 we are going to see ladies and gentlemen uh, aristocrats in the national assembly attempt to halt things nobles are being murdered okay uh you know estates are being burned okay uh Peasants are refusing to, to pay their dues, being very aggressive. Uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, robberies from bakeries. Um, it, it's wild out there, okay? And the aristocracy understands that if they want to, unless, if they want to survive this, they need to make some changes, okay? So we are going to see the National Assembly vote to abolish feudalism, okay? What does that mean? The corvée, a lot of those taxes, they're gone, okay? They're gone. Okay, and all French men, at least in principle, are going to be subject to the same laws and same taxes and eligible for the same offices. So, but this is important, ladies and gentlemen, is we are seeing the nobles, the nobility say, hey, let's get rid of some of this feudalism. And they're doing this because if they don't, they're dead. All right, they're in trouble. All right, so this is really important as we are seeing feudalism abolished. Very important. The sale of government offices, abolish. Corvée, abolish. Those privileges, those hunting rights, abolished. Some of those unequal taxes, abolished. Very important, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a huge victory for the peasants. And the nobility is really forced to do this, ladies and gentlemen, if they want to survive. Okay? If they want to survive. Let's continue. Another important document comes out of this, ladies and gentlemen. And this is where we start to see the Enlightenment really uh, uh, enter the French Revolution is we see an important uh, declaration, important document of the French Revolution. I'm going to give you this document to read and hip and understand, and we'll talk about it at a study session, uh, um, but the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Okay, And this is a, uh, a statement of broad political principles prior to their first constitution of 1791. And take a look at it, ladies and gentlemen, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen taken straight out of the American Revolution, the Declaration of Independence. So there's a, this is a declaration very in spirit of the Enlightenment, similar to the American Revolution, of, 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 the, of the principles that, the, that France wants to have guide their government. Okay? Uh, and this is very, uh, very much influenced by the American Constitution and the Enlightenment. So the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, ladies and gentlemen, very much influenced by America, Bill of Rights, Constitution, okay, and Declaration of Independence, and this is going to proclaim these natural rights of French citizens. Now, when I when I when I go when, when you go through the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, okay, I want you to be thinking about the enlightened philosophs that you're seeing in this document. 
Locke, Voltaire, Beccaria, okay, Montesquieu. Be thinking about who you see, all right, because this is the enlightenment in action, okay, the enlightenment in action. So we're going to see, you know, in this Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, men are born free and equal in rights. Natural rights, liberty, property, security, resistance to oppression, right? We have John Locke right there. The freedom of expression and religion. We have Voltaire right there. Due process of the law. Innocence until proof of guilt. We have Beccaria. So we have, we have the enlightenment in action in this document, ladies and gentlemen. It is so important. Freedom of religion. Taxation is, uh, you know, equal taxation. Property is a sacred right. We have the enlightenment, ladies and gentlemen. We have the enlightenment uh, in France. Okay, very important. All right, now, it's important to understand, though, ladies and gentlemen, that this Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, it was written specifically for men and largely excluded women. And so it's important to understand is that, you know, France is talking, you know, a big game about equality, liberty, but mainly for men, okay? And mainly for uh, 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 men of privilege, okay? Men of privilege, uh, uh, privilege okay? Um, you know, uh, there, there's still slavery, and, and we see an entire uh, gender, women being excluded from this. Okay, very important. So typically, uh, men of privilege. All right. Um, so, uh, the in the Declaration of Rights of Man uh, and Citizen posed a lot of new dilemmas. Did women have equal rights with men? You know, what about, what about uh, 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 Africans uh, in the colonies? Okay, uh, what about them? Okay. You know, and how could how could slavery be justified in all, in, in, in you know humanity in France if um you know if uh you know men are born free you know so if all men are born free so it, it, it's important to understand is is who is this Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen um you know who is it talking to who is it who who is who 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 is free who has these rights okay that, that's kind of where I want to get at all right there, there, it's a specific audience that have these rights. You know, it, it doesn't pertain necessarily to women and some people of color. All right, so important important to understand that, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, um, yeah, and another question. Did religious toleration of Protestants, you know, for Jews, Muslims, are they going to be able to get full religious toleration or is it just for, uh, you know, a certain group? Okay, so important for us to understand that, ladies and gentlemen. Let's talk about the rights of women, ladies and gentlemen. Women did gain some rights during this time, okay? Now, we're going to see Rousseau really and some of that sexism that we talked about in the Enlightenment really infiltrate the revolution, but women did gain some rights during this time. They are going to have some increased rights to divorce, property, get child support. However, really important for us to understand the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen largely did not acknowledge women. Uh, they are not going to have equal rights, and we're going to be seeing that. Okay, they can't vote, hold office. Okay, we will see the exclusion largely of women. Okay, let's talk about the Declaration of the Rights of Women. This is written by Olympe de Gouget, and we're going to talk about uh, her, and we're going to talk about her Declaration of Rights of Women. This was specifically addressed to Marie Antoinette and women in France, and she wrote uh, much of this document um, is is uh, you know reprinted. Is she's she just copied the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and simply crossed out men and wrote women in various clauses, and um, she she is advocating for the rights of women. She's saying, hey, you're talking about all these, um, you're talking about all these. Uh, uh, you know, rights for men, but what about what about women? Okay, um, and and she she's saying that women should be able to own property. Okay, and require men to recognize the paternity of their children. That women should have access to education. She is going to be saying women need equal rights too. You're you know she's talking to the National Assembly. You're talking this big game of uh, you know equality, liberty, you know freedom, but it's to a certain audience. Okay, it's to a certain it's meet for a cer certain people. Okay. All right. Now, another huge event, ladies and gentlemen, that's illustrating the inclusion of women, and we saw women play an important part within uh, the Enlightenment, the salons. Women are going to play a really important part in the revolution as well. And the March of uh, Women uh, in 1789, so we've kind of gone from August, September, okay, now we're in uh, uh, October of 1789, is we're going to see a huge demonstration of women for bread. Um, and um, we'll watch a little clip of this uh, in class, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but famine was a big deal. Uh, you would have people, you know, uh, fainting, you know, in their homes because they haven't eaten for three or four days. All right. Um, and so we're going to see the Parisian, um, a mass demonstration of women uh, to uh, for bread. And they, they were hungry. And I mean, these this was serious. I mean, look, look at uh, look at this crowd right here carrying uh, all kinds of weapons. They have a cannon. OK, 
they were upset, and this is showing the inclusion and participation of women within the revolt, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Now, the October uh, days is uh, really important, ladies and gentlemen, because this march on Versailles um, is going to force the king to move to Paris and reside in Paris. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna, uh, take him uh, and uh, Louis XVI and Marie uh, Antoinette and the royal family and the court and force them to move to Paris and say, uh-uh, you are going to stay with us. Okay, and this is showing Louis losing control of the situation. Okay, and he's in he's in a very vulnerable uh, vulnerable position now. Okay, a very vulnerable position. All right, because this situation he's quickly losing control of it. Okay, um, and uh, the National Assembly is also going to be forced to move to Paris and stay in Paris, and they were very much uh, intimidated by the uh, uh, the people of Paris. Okay, all right, let's stop here for today, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see the creation of the Constitution, the Constitution of 1791, and the creation of our second phase that we're going to be talking about, which is the Legislative Assembly. Excellent job today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to stop here, and uh, the next lecture will kind of be focusing on uh, the Legislative Assembly. Thank you.